Yeah, thank you. Yeah, welcome to the talk, Using Asymmetric Keys to Secure Applications. We're going to talk about three main areas. A, asymmetric keys, can canonicalization, and JOTs. How are we going to use them, what are they used for, and how do we make applications more secure? My name is Dan Toyer, and I will share the stage with uh, Mario Niebler. All good? All right, I'll wait for that, because we're going to start with the code sample. So we want to see that. Yes. Gotcha. What do you need it for? Video. You're not hooked in because this is network. Oh, I don't need network. Oh, perfect. I apologize for the delay. No worries. All right, perfect. Thank you. Perfect. And we're jumping right in. So you've probably seen that already. Um, a simple code sample. This is sending a message to a cell phone. And um, this is pretty much done with our Java helper libraries. In the first part, we instantiate the client. And what we're passing in here is an API key and a secret. And it's pretty much our shared secret. In the second part, we're actually creating the message and defining the uh, number where we're going to send it to, where it's coming from, and the message itself. We call the create message, pass in the client, and you should receive that on your phone. Now, over the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk about how can we use asymmetric keys in only one line of code. And what we're doing here is we're going to overwrite the HTTP client, and we're going to insert two additional parameters. The first one is the public key sit, a reference to the public key, and then your private key. With both of those, um, we'll additional, add additional methods of securing your call. But why do you want to do that? So the goals are that the customer, in this case you, would never have to share the, the secret. And also, that allows us to validate the identity of the client for every call that comes in. And the reasons are manifold. But some of them are, some of our larger enterprises, for example, have requirements around information security. They have like internal guidelines that they want to follow, or they're in an industry that requires them to take additional steps in how to secure secrets. But let's go back to the first example, where we just used um, a shared secret, basic authentication. In this case, there's a string that's shared between the API provider and the customer. And usually in the case of an API provider, the key is created by the API provider. You go to the console, you get the key, you get your secret. If you're on a web application, you go on the web, often you're familiar with the use of like, creating a username and password. Same thing. You created a shared secret. We're going to focus on the API going forward. So in this case, what's happening? HTTP uh, basic authentication is defined in an RFC, and it's the most common use of authentication on the web. And the way it's transmitted is you take the key, you take a colon, you take the secret, and you base64 encode it. Uh, and this is what you see on the, on the bottom right here. The author, authorization header uh, is pretty much your base64 encoded uh, key secret. This is protected when you send it over HTTPS. And this is a very simplification of how HTTPS works. Uh, but basically, you have a certificate on the server. The client requests it before they establish a session, validates it with uh, certification authority, um, and then at that point, you have established trust from the client to the server. Um, and that's a very suitable solution for most of the web applications out there. Now, if you want to go one step further and go back to what the goal was that we discussed earlier, and we want to establish that trust from the server to the client, then we need to go to something called mutual authentication. And there's basic, uh, basically two ways on how you can do that. 
You can go down the route of mutual TLS or a signature-based validation approach. Mutual TLS is standardized, and it's pretty much using the steps that you saw with the SSL in two ways. You have two certificates, you exchange them in both ways, and then you can pretty much trust, um, you have trust from the client to the server, and from the server to the client. But on the other side, that's also an infra infrastructure level solution. That means your edges need to support that. So if you have ELBs, uh, for example, and they don't support that functionality, then you have a problem on where do you terminate your SSL. Alternatively, it can use the signature-based validation approach. This is a customizable and expandable solution. If you want to change in the future, you can. And also, it's on the application level. This means you give the control to the developer. You can implement it at the application layer. It's also the approach that we uh, chose to further secure authentication. And with that, we have three goals. Is that we want the customer never to have to share the secret. On the second one, we want to validate the identity of the client with every request. And the third one that comes pretty much for free. And this is to ensure that the message was not tampered in transit. So for that, we're going to need three components. And we're going to uh, discuss each one of them. We're going to talk about asymmetric keys, where we pretty much have a key pair that consists of a public and a private key. We're going to talk about re request canonicalization. And this is an HTTP. A request can have multiple forms that all mean the same thing. So we need to bring that into a standardized form. And then we're using JSON Web Tokens, JOTS, um, to represent claims between, um, between parties. Let's jump into the first one, asymmetric keys. So we already discussed asymmetric keys. At this point, we have a private key and a public key. And um, the customer is going to create both of those keys. That means they never need to be shared. They're mathematically related. And once created, the customer then can go ahead and share the public key um, with the party they're communicating with. In our case, it would be Twilio. So at that point, we pretty much accomplished the first goal. We never shared a key. One of the basic use cases of uh, public-private keys is to encrypt the message. And at that point, we take the, uh, pretty much, if you gave the, the key to Twilio, we could encrypt, let's say, a recording, store it for you, and only the person with the public key then can go back um, and decrypt it and listen to the recording. But we're going to use it in a different way. We're going to use the find and verify um, capabilities. And this is now as the sender of the message, the client as the sender of the message, uses their private key to sign the message that they sent to Twilio. What that means is you take the message, you sign it, you get a little signature, attach it to the message, and send it um, to the receiving party. At that point, you can validate two things. A, that the message was signed with the private key that belongs to the public key uh, the recipient holds in the hand. And on the other side, that the message was not changed in transit. So now, if we're applying this um, to the message that, that, that we're sending, we need to do one more thing. Because now we're not using a document that we're signing. We're signing an HTTP request. And like I mentioned before, HTTP requests can have multiple forms that they come in and all mean the same. So we need to add the can canonicalization in front of it. So the customer comes, takes the request, canonicalize it. Now we have a standardized form. Um, you can take this and sign it with the private key and attach the signature to the request. Both the canonicalization and the attaching the signature is something uh, Mario is going to discuss in much more detail. Also, one thing to note, with this solution, the private key never leaves the hand of the customer. So now on the receiving end, now, now we're looking at from Twilio. We, we're getting a request that's signed. What can we do? We take the message and the uh, signature, separate those, and then 
walk pretty much through the same steps that happened on the client side um, to canonicalize the request, sign it, this time with the public key, and then we can go ahead and take those two signature and validate that they match. If they match, we, can, we have uh, pretty much proven two things. We have proven the identity of the client because since the secret is never sh shared, the only person who can have the private key is the customer. And on the other hand, if the message was changed, signatures will not match. So if both of those are true, um, we're happy with the request. With that, I'm going to ask Mario. Hi, my name is Mario. I am the tech lead for Twilio's identity team. Um, so last session of the day, perfect time to talk about request canonicalization. <laughs> um, so what is request canonicalization? Um, so prior to signing an HTTP request, we have to canonicalize it. And so what that means is converting a request that can have many equivalent forms uh, into a standard nor or normalized form. So on the right side here, you see uh, an HTTP request example. Um, on, the bottom, on the bottom is the, the canonical form of that request. And that's what we're going to try to do in this, in this section. So why do we want to canonicalize a request? Um, the URL, sp URL specifications can have uh, support many equivalent forms that say the same things. So on the right side, on the equivalent URLs thing, you see uh, there's three URLs that all point you to the Twilio homepage. Uh, also, HTTP itself can be somewhat forgiving. Um, you know, we can order query parameters in different ways, and they all essentially mean the same thing. We can URL encode certain characters. Again, those mean the same thing. Uh, also, uh, when you think about headers in HTTP, uh, header names are case insensitive. So you could use all uppercase, all lowercase, mixed case, and those all essentially mean the same thing. Um, but the most important reason why we want to canonicalize a request is because uh, by the time a server receives a request, it might not be in the same, it might not look exactly the same as the client sent it. Um, so the first thing we want to do is we want to cr create a canonical request string, right? And this is this form I was talking about on the right. Uh, you'll see that's essentially a canonical, a, a form of a canonical HTTP request. Uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to hash that, re that, re that canonical request string. Uh, then we're going to send that request hash in some form to the server. The server is then going to use that request hash to validate that the request was sent in, in its original form. Now, this follows mostly, um, there's a, AWS has a signature version 4 on their website you can look at. So we're going to follow mo more or less what they do with a few differences. Um, before we get started into canonicalization, let's quickly review what an HTTP request looks like. Uh, the first thing you're going to see in an HTTP request is there's a request line. That's typically the uh, request method. Um, there's, that's followed by a resource and then some, something about the version of the protocol we're using. That is always followed by some collection of request headers. Uh, finally, there's an optional body uh, that may be present. So again, looking on the right side, we see the request, HTTP request format above. Down below is a request example. Um, so the first thing we want to do in normalization is we want to normalize the method. This is actually the easiest thing to do. Uh, for any HTTP library using, this already comes normalized. The main thing you have to make sure of is that the re request method is trimmed. That means no white space on either side. And you want to make sure it's in uppercase. Uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to normalize the resource. This is actually the hardest part, so we're going to skip this for now and come back to it. Next, we want to normalize the HTTP request headers. So to do that, we first want to lowercase all the header names. If you remember, I said header names are case insensitive, so we want to use a standard, uh, standard casing, so let's use lowercase. Then we want to trim everything. Uh, all the values that might have spaces anywhere, trim, those from, trim the spaces from the ends. Uh, if there are spaces in quoted strings, we retain those spaces. Um, Finally, we want to sort all the headers by name. Now, there's a special case with HTTP headers. If you have looked at a lot of headers in your life, uh, you understand that the HTTP headers are actually a multi-map, so you can have multiple values for one header. Um, generally, this has to be comma-separated. There's a few exceptions to this. 
but for the most part, that's how they come. Um, so when we have those multi-valued headers, we want to sort those values. All right, so let's quickly review what we did with these headers. We trimmed everything that's not quoted. We sorted all the headers by lowercase header names. We sorted the multi-valued headers. Uh, we concatenate all of those with line breaks, and now we're finished. We have a canonical set of request headers. Uh, but I lied. We can't actually hash all these headers. We can't include all the request headers in our request hash. The reason why is because um, when a client sends a request to a server, there typically are proxies and gateways in between that might add headers and, and mutate the, the request in some way. Um, so we don't want to break uh, something in transit from client to server. Also, after we construct our request hash, we're going to need to add our own header that defines what the request hash is. So what we want to do is we only want to hash the headers we care about. Um, obviously, there's some headers are more important than others. So in our case, in our request example, we only want to hash uh, the host header and the X my header header. Uh, furthermore, we need to tell the server when, about when we created the request hash, which of the headers were included as part of that request hash. And the server is going to use that list of headers to validate later. So let's come up with a new header. We're going to call it hashed headers. And this is essentially the list of headers that we've used for our request hash. Um, and we're going to treat those hashed headers like a multi-valued header. We're just going to trim everything. We're going to sort everything. And we're going to concatenate them all with a delimiter. So now the body. Um, the body is one of the parts of the HTTP request that hopefully should not change in transit. So for the most part, we can treat this as a sequence of characters. Uh, if we don't have a body, we can just use an empty string. So now I, let's come back to normalizing the resource. Remember I said earlier that this is the hardest part. Um, so the reason why this is hard is because URIs can be very complex. Uh, they can have many equivalent forms. And they're somewhat hard to perfectly normalize. But we're going to you know, give it a good shot. So some things on the right side here to, to note is if you have a star, that could be represented as percent to A. It could be represented as percent to lowercase a. Again, uh, query parameters, the, the sorting, the order of the, uh, the query parameters uh, doesn't matter, so you could have different ordering. Uh, finally, there's this funny thing called dot notation in URLs, uh, dot, dot, or dot, um, and they mean special things. So the first thing when it comes to normalizing a resource is we want to make sure to URI encode. And typically, the kind of characters that we would encode are things like reserved characters, unsafe characters, and non-ASCII characters. Uh, generally, when we URI encode something, we want to use the uppercase hexadecimal form. So in the example here, we have the resource sum plus thing. And instead of an N, I'm using an Enya character, which is a non-ASCII character. And so the finalized URI encoded form of this, I would replace the plus with a percent to B. I would re replace the Enya, the, the non-ASCII character, with percent %C3, percent %B1. Uh, next, remember that thing I said, dot segments. Uh, dot segments are relative references in, in paths. So we want to resolve those and remove them. Again, dot means current directory. Dot dot means parent directory. So on the bottom here, you see the, normal, the final form of the normalized path. Uh, the next part of the URL, when the resource we want to uh, normalize is the query string. So what we want to do with the query string is first we want to URI encode all the key value pairs. Uh, we want to make sure to retain the equal sign in between them. Then we want to sort the key value pairs by the, by the uh, query parameter name. Finally, we concatenate all the key value pairs again and make sure to concatenate them with an ampersand. Um, so what we should have now is uh, a canonical request string. If we look at the re kind of canonical request format that I mentioned in, at the beginning, we have a method, we have a resource, we have some collection of headers, we have the hash headers that we talk about. These are the headers that we, that we included in our request hash. Finally, we have a body. So the canonical request example is down below. On the right side, the canonical request get slash something, the host header, the X my header header, 
uh, and the list of hashed headers. So what we want to do with that finally is we want to hash that, right? That just means sticking it through a hashing function. Uh, and then the next thing we want to do is we need to find a way to transmit this request hash to the server. So let's talk about JOTS. So what do we need to transmit with this request, right? Well, obviously, we need to transmit the original request. Uh, we need to transmit the canonical request hash, which we just calculated. We need to transmit the list of hashed headers. That is, the headers that we use to construct the request hash. Uh, it might be a good idea to set an expiration so that we know how long this request is good for. Um, collectively, we might consider all these together as security metadata. So again, on the right side, our example request. There is a request hash, some hash uh, of the canonical form, uh, a list of hashed headers, and an expiration timestamp. But what's missing? Well, we certainly want to prevent this data from being tampered with since it's security metadata. Um, so we need to sign the security metadata. And on the, this happens on the client side using the customer's private key. But what else might we think about? Um, well, what if tomorrow we want to rotate our public key and use a different one? Well, we don't want to break anything, so it might be a good idea to support multiple keys. And to do that, we would need to transmit a key identifier so that the server knows the public key that should be used to validate this request. Another thing we might think about is what about uh, different signing algorithms? What if tomorrow your security chief comes into your office and says, hey, this RSA signing algorithm you're using is, has been hacked. This is, it's, it's proven no good, so let's switch uh, algorithms. So to do that, we would need to also transmit the specific signing algorithm that was used to sign this request. So how do we send all this stuff? If we look on the right side here, now we're, our list of security metadata is getting kind of big. We have a request hash. We have some hashed headers, an expiration timestamp, a key identifier, and some signing algorithm. So we could just send this as more headers, of course. But it would be nice to have a more packaged format. Uh, it would be even nicer if this was a broadly understood, widely supported format. So in our case, we're going to use JSON web tokens or JOTS. So some characteristics of JOTS that make it particularly appealing for our case is JOTS support uh, signing with asymmetric keys. They support signing with different algorithms. They support key identifiers, expirations, and they're pretty broadly supported. So let's quickly look at what a JOT looks like. Uh, JOTS have a header field or header section. They have a payload section. And finally, they have a signature. And so typically when you see a JOT, those three values are concatenated uh, into one, and base64 encoded as one string. So let's see about how to construct a JOT with the security metadata that we just talked about. Um, so the header, in the header, we're going to put the algorithm that we use. Uh, something worth noting about JOTs is whatever JOT library you use, make sure that it's very explicit about what signing alg algorithms you support and which ones you do not support. Um, in the payload, we're going to put our key identifier. That's the key that the, the server should use to validate this request. We have an expiration timestamp. We have our request header. We have the list of hashed headers. Uh, and finally, that all gets signed. And we have the final form down below, which is a long sequence of, of characters. Um, so what we want to do then is we want to attach this jot as a single header to the request. Uh, this jot already contains a signature, of course. If we were to decompose that JOT, this contains all the security metadata that we care about. And that is enough to validate the request. So now Dan's going to come up for a few fi final thoughts. Thank you. All right, what did we accomplish? And we pretty much took care of our three goals that we had. That the customer never needs to uh, share the secret that we can validate the identity of the client with every call, and that we ensure the message has not been tampered with in transit. A couple of things to note. This is one way of doing it. And um, maybe it's useful uh, that you're uh, interested in the technologies. You can implement something similar for your client server communication. But um, I think part of the interesting thing here is most of the details here can abstract it 
for the client side, and literally we did it in one line of code, right? Um, and behind it is like all the canonicalization, the jots, and the different keys that we're using. So yeah, with that, if, you, if you're interested in um, how our implementation looks like in the details, also canonicalization is discussed in more things, you can go to the bit.ly link, that's twilio-pkcv. Thank you. <laughs>